Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that your word would uh, fall into uh, good soil of our hearts so you could bear fruit for eternal life. Help us to remember what you, we must and forget what was uh, uh, said from man, from me, and what was uh, coming from you would remain and bear fruit forever. In Jesus' name, amen. How shall we be the church in the post-Christian era? How shall we be uh, the church in modern-day Babylon? Neither assimilation nor separatism will do. How shall we then live? That's my topic this morning. We just read the passage I will be expanding over, and I will start now. I also want to know, tell you that um, I was inspired heavily in, uh, in this uh, teaching from this author called Erwin Lutzer, The Church in Babylon, a wonderful book. And we are uh, uh, basically uh, reading it together with uh, Sam here uh, online and uh, to see what we can apply and retain for our lives. So times are changing, aren't they? The worldview of our culture, whether in France or in the West in general, is moving further and further away from its historical heritage and spiritual moorings. This trend is going global, beyond national borders through the internet and social media. Here are some examples in France of the cultural changes I'm talking about. But it is, it's not just in France, it's all over the world in a sense. This past week, I wrote to five senators as a representatives of a Protestant evangelical calls of our county. I also met a representative of our parliament with a couple of my French colleagues. Our goal was to attract their attention to the bill of law that was just voted in parliament a week ago that will be discussed and amended by senators by the end of this month. It is a very worrisome legislative piece and move that will impact all religions, not just the Christians, all religions and associations in the, com in the country. The good 19th, 1905 law that is established separation of church and state is being deeply questioned, yet it gave so much freedom to both churches and state until now. It was a good law. Everybody was happy with it. If it is not amended, freedom of speech as we know it in our churches today, will be impacted and restrained. We fear that. Freedom of association, freedom of conscience and religion will also be curtailed. Hundreds of small local churches or cultural associations will close down. They won't be able to keep up financially. It will be particularly be felt among Protestant churches and associations like ours, which primarily use the 1905 law. The, the original goal of this Bill of Law crafted by our government was legitimate, fighting Islamic terrorism and separatism. I'm going to talk about that. If we're to believe what almost all religions of this country say, it, like in the Figaro magazine just uh, uh, last week, this goal will completely be missed and punish only those who posed no danger to public order and safety. It is a fact. Government control on churches and religion in general is on the rise in France and many parts of the world. Soon, a bioethic bill of law, if voted as, in, in its, uh, as written in its original form, will oblige obstetricians, doctors, and possibly nurses uh, to disobey their conscience if they want to keep their job. Remember the midwives in Egypt in the days of Pharaoh. Some ask the question, in the near future, will those medical professions will still be a viable option for a dedicated Christian college student who wants to obey his conscience? As you can see, it is no longer very popular to be singled out as a Christian in postmodern France and Europe in general, increasingly so. Of course, there is no outright outrage persecution in France, as it is increasingly the case in major parts of the world. But 
the heat is increasing. Our countries are rejecting the Judeo-Christian values on which our civilization was founded. This is an evidence the church as an institution has lost its clout and influence. It is being pushed out of the public space. Everybody is being told in terms that are no longer subliminal to keep their religious beliefs and practice private. As if it was possible to divorce what you believe from what you do or say. So much for freedom of speech then. Freedom of association even, some say. Yes, times have changed. So, how as Christians should we then live? How shall we be the church in a post-Christian era? How shall we be the church in modern-day Babylon? You understand why I've chosen this text? It's a very, very relevant. We have several options before us. The first two, uh, the first two are a dead end. Why? Because first, neither separatism nor second, assimilation to a pagan culture will do. The third option is much more preferable. It is spelled out in, blank, in, in black and white in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29. When the Jewish people were deported to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar in 597, we know the date, it's very precise, it's very identified, before the birth of Jesus Christ, they lost everything. They lost their country, their king, their temple that was so beloved and which they magically thought would uh, protect them in spite of they had completely become idolatrous as a people. They were brutally catapulted in a pagan, uh, into a pagan empire with a foreign language um, among an ultra-violent and cruel people that showed no mercy to the weak, a pluralist society of sort, completely idolatrous and morally depraved. You can barely imagine the state of shock they were in. Most survivors in the siege of Jerusalem had witnessed horrors of wars, their children thrown against the rocks. This is found in, in the Psalms. Their families decimated, tortured, their nation quasi-genocided. Only the strong and the fittest made it to Babylon on foot, where they were deported 600 kilometers away. After they arrived in their new country, encouraged by false prophets, as we read it in this text, they only thought of returning to their land. Yet the prophet Jeremiah, who was still in Jerusalem, wrote the leaders, uh, the, leaders the priests, and other survivors, a very shocking letter that we read. Its content went against the false prophets pre predicting that they would soon return to uh, Jerusalem. The word of the Lord revealed to Jeremiah for his people in exile contained also a very counterintuitive request. How would you have reacted if you had been in their place? How would you interact with a culture that makes you feel that you are a second-class citizen. If we transpose to our situation in the 21st century in France, how could we share the gospel in a culture that despises our values and our message as Christians? Increasingly so, I'm very sad to say. What should we do so as not to lose our identity when we are de facto identified as politically incorrect citizens, increasingly so. The first option, I said, that was before them, just as it is before us today, uh, is a very natural reaction. It is a temptation of separatism, separation, and rejection of the culture, and its citizens, to that, uh, and, and its citizens uh, that do not subs subscribe to our values. That was their first option. The second option is also very tempting, choosing assimilation in order to blend in with the masses around us to be accepted and avoid suffering. It's so natural. And the third option is the one proposed by the Lord himself, the way of an 
engaged alienation, that's the word used by Erwin Lutzer, a proactive decision to engage peacefully and respectfully the dominant culture while cultivating uh, without compromise our distinctive identity as Christians. It is the way of Jesus for his disciples. Didn't he say in John chapter 17, slide, I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am not of the world, said Jesus. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you, you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Set them apart. Your word is truth. As you sent me, said Jesus, into, into the world, I have sent them out huh, into the world. So take courage, my friends. The Lord has prayed for us. Praise God. He prayed so we could live in this very world, in this very age and culture. He did not say he would spare us from trials, from martyrs for some people today. There have not been more martyrs uh, in the past century than in the, the 19th centuries before. But he promised to walk with us through the fire like Daniel and his friends. Just like he was sent in this world and yet he was not of this world, so are we, so are you. In the world but not of. We don't belong to this world because we already belong to another. We have another king. We belong to another kingdom and we submit to his rule. That's what we mean when we pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. So let's review those three options, in particular the one given by Jeremiah. First option, separation and rejection, which are a dead end. That is the choice some of the exiles made in anger and full of bitterness because of all the atrocities and horrors they had witnessed. They chose to retreat behind the walls of their tight-knit community just like the cowboys in the far west days who could, would circle the wagons, you know, uh, when they were under attack. The temptation is strong to retreat into the safety of our own bubble when you feel rejected, hurt, or under threat. Throughout history, some have said, let's mind our own business. Let's take care of our own only. Let's abandon to the world, let's abandon the world to its own evil and destructive ways. It is true that each time a society, Israel is a case in point in the text, or an individual, each time they break a limit set by God, there will be consequences. Suffering will ensue. Quickly or eventually, a judgment will fall after a breaking point is reached when the patience of, God, of the grace uh, of God says enough is enough. It is not that God is mean, but each sin committed has a judgment attached to it. You cannot transgress the laws that govern this reality and get away with it forever. Reality is very intolerant, my friend. Just like facts, they don't care about your feelings and opinions. Either you are aligned with reality or you are not, and disaster ensues. For instance, if you feel you can hate or cancel, words uh, that are very in fashion these days, if you believe you can hate or cancel at will whomever you disagree with, have no doubt, one day it will be your turn. Because you were not created to live in hate or be the supreme judge with life and death powers over people whose opinions you don't like. That is exactly what happened to the famous bloody French Robespierre, a revolutionist who chopped the heads of thousands, so many of his, cit his own citizens. He deemed counter-revolutionist. He terrorized many. And in the end, guess what? 
he finished 20 centimeters shorter <laughs> after he was condemned to the guillotine by his former intolerant friends. He was probably accused of not being revolutionary enough, maybe. As you can see, you cannot break free from reality without dramatic consequences, whether uh, in your personal and family realm, or without causing some form of community and environmental breakdown. So if you're tempted by a spirit of rejection and separatism from the unfair world you live in, just ask yourself, as a Christian, is it fair to turn your back to your neighbor? Is it fair to break ties to the larger community of your cities and villages? Don't we profit uh, from some common good it still brings to us and our children through city and state services? Schooling for our children, unemployment benefits, social security, schooling for our children, free, unemployment benefits, uh, etc. Free health care, even though there's no free lunch, it costs somebody something. A functioning administration, an army, to name a few. These are common grace and common good we should be thankful for while they last. Would it be fair to behave as if we were not concerned by the welfare of our fellow citizens and neighbors who don't like us? This kind of thinking has hurt the church at times throughout history. A certain form of pietism taught erroneously that in order to separate from the world, Disciples had to separate from sinners and from the world at large. Didn't, didn't define that very well. Some in the past under, understood that as becoming monks and nuns living in a remote convents and monasteries completely cut off from the rest of society. Protestants were not spared from this spirit. Ascetism, monasticism were often then given as the summum of Christian godliness and models. Let me tell you the Bible teaches something different. We are called to separate from the spirit of this world, which is a spirit of rebellion at work by the devil, uh, the devil's presence in the world and society at large. This spirit has no problem sitting on the pews of our churches, even here, because it is constantly trying to find a dwelling in our very own hearts. So if we're to part with something or from something with the help of the Holy Spirit and by the grace of God and truth, let's constantly work to discern in order to part from sin in our own lives and not from the people in the world whom God loves so deeply and that he sends us to. It is true that the church as an institution has not always been the salt Jesus speaks about. The salt is an agent of preservation, uh, to preserve food from decay and corruption. Preserving ourselves morally and spiritually speaking is essential as disciples if we want to have a distinct message uh, for our contemporaries. If we, have, we are assimilated to the point of being no different, they won't see the difference. In Babylon, that is one of our roles in society, by our merry existence, by your words, by our actions. It is true also that salt gives a taste to life. But in order to give its distinctive flavor, salt needs to be in touch with the food. Salt in the salt shaker is of not much use. Just like Christians who retreat behind the safety of their church walls, meeting only with their good and like-minded friends. That church does not have much of an impact on the world at large. It is true that the church has not always been the light Jesus speaks about, a light that shows the way and embodies the truth of the gospel. Without this light, nobody can distinguish anything in the dark. Without the light of God, His word, you can't discriminate good from evil. You cannot differentiate what is holy from what is profane. You don't even have the words for it. So let's not make the same mistake. Rejection or separatism 
are a dead end. It was true for the Jewish people uh, deported to Babylon, and it is still true for us disciples of Jesus today in France or in America, wherever you are in 2021. Second option, assimilation. What is that? When you feel rejected for your ideas, your beliefs, your ethical choices or behaviors, because you want to be in line with your spiritual convictions, it is very tempting to yield to the pressures of the majority around us, to the majority standards. Do as the Romans do. Yield to the politically correct agenda. Force yourself to speak like everybody else. Some people talk, talk in French about la nouvelle langue, uh, the new language like in the famous uh, novel uh, uh, where uh, words or some words were prohibited and you had to use new words to define reality. Who controls the words controls you and the masses in order to call evil good and good evil, for instance. Align your public opinion with the camp of good, even if it doesn't make sense or even if it breaks your personal code of beliefs and ethics. That's the message of the culture. Who likes to suffer anyway? I don't. I'm not a masochist. So are you. Who wants to be singled out as being different in the workplace or in, in the neighborhood? Likewise, the temptation was great for the deported Jews in Babylon to blend in. It was much easier to cease their devotion to the one true God, Yahweh, in a very pluralistic and idolatrous society. And if they did not, it was very tempting to make their faith only a private practice in the safety of their family homes. Why? Because they were the cultural mi minority that had been overpowered by the Babylonian bulldozer. Because they did not want to be looked down upon. Because Juda Judaism was not the religion of the emperor and the cultural elites. Because they feared ostracism and persecution from their neighbors and authorities who could blame them. Many of them probably succumbed to the temptation of assimilation into the dominant, dominant Babylonian culture. How do we suspect that? Well, in 538 before Christ, the prophecy Jeremy had made in this letter started to materialize. We read it, remember? He said he would come back 70 years after. God had promised they would return to their homeland in Israel after 70 years of deportation. And when God, God uh, promises something in a biblical prophecy, it always comes to pass. But the return was only partial. That's how we know that some had succumbed to uh, the temptation of assimilation. Only a small fraction of the Jewish people who had settled in Babylon agreed to return. Yet they had the full blessing of the emperor by miracle. But among the few survivors, over 90 years old, can you imagine that? And their descendants, only 40,000 journeyed back to Jerusalem. Among the deportees in Babylon, many of their children and grandchildren were not able to speak or even to read the Torah in Hebrew. Many they did not know the law of Yahweh, their God. They didn't know God anymore. A good number had become pagan, syncretists, and idolaters. They no longer were a holy people that stood apart from the polytheist nations around Israel. They no longer were a light to the nations as God had elected them to be. <coughs> Excuse me. That's my throat. In short, they had been assimilated into the Babylonian culture. Today, it is very easy for us to the assembly of God, the church of Jesus Christ, to identify with the Jewish people in exile at Babylon. Aren't we called by Peter the Apostle as foreigners and exiles? There's a slide about that. Among the pagans. So never forget who you are where you're from and where you are heading to. Choosing the way of assimilation is a fatal mistake. 
we are called to separate from the spirit of this world. Yes, we know that. Resistance is not futile. You don't have to be assimilated. And the, the Star Trek fans have recognized the famous, famous line. You don't have to be assimilated by the Borg. Resistance is futile. You <laughs> shall be assimilated. Uh, if you are a Star Trek fan, you know what I mean. Uh, humor intended. <laughs> Living differently and peacefully, showing love to our neighbors in a culture that abhors our values is not the easy way. It is a fact. Ask the average Christian living in the Middle East and, or in Asia, and you'll understand what I mean in some parts of Asia. Yet choosing to follow Jesus on the narrow path that leads to eternal life is still the right decision if we call ourselves disciples of Christ. So whether we are in Jerusalem or in Babylon, whether we live in an era and society where uh, Jesus and his church are well accepted or not, discriminated or not, the course is set. Let's persevere, whatever the cost. We are to follow our Lord and Master because He is good and true and He is ahead of us. We shall overcome because Jesus walks among us. And that's what Peter said. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us, He visits them. Are we convinced that the church of Jesus Christ is the last barrier that preserves human civilization from total chaos, chaos and moral breakdown? Think of the much good that the church and its values and the Word of God has brought to the world. We're going back, I'm afraid, to barbarian values. I'm just, I'm convinced of that. Just watch the internet, the news. I believe the church contains and proclaims the only good news that can save the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, neither separatism nor assimilation will do. How should we then live? Let's choose the path proposed by the Lord in Jeremiah's letter to the exiles. The path of an engaged alienation. We want to engage the culture peacefully, lovingly, without losing our soul and identity of disciples of Jesus. We want to empathize as much as we can with our suffering world around us without ever compromising the standards of holiness God calls us to as his people. We want to be involved in the cities and neighborhoods where God has plan planted us in order to bless the communities uh, where we live. As Jesus Christ, we want to be servants, servants uh, in our communities of our fellow citizens, as good and honest citizens. We want to honor our secular authorities without ever forgetting there is only one supreme king. We worship God, not man. They are not in competition. They don't play in the same court. We will be obedient citizens as far as our conscience allows to. But our, Lord and res uh, but, but our love and respect will always go first to our Lord and his holy commands. Just as Jesus commanded us, we want to go into the world without ever forgetting that we are not of this world because we belong to another. The godly Jews survived the Babylonian cultural bulldozer. Yes, there were some that survived, 40,000 at least. But not all of them. They survived for 70 years in a hostile and foreign culture. Those who remained faithful to the Lord did not forget neither their language nor their identity as the chosen people of God. Many empires tried to cancel the messianic line by genocide 
of the Jewish people. That's why the Jewish people are genocided again and again and again throughout history. The devil wants to get rid of them as if he could prevent the return of the victorious Messiah we're all waiting for. The empires of the Egyptians, uh, the Egyptian pharaohs, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Nazis, the Communist Soviet Union, Al-Qaeda, etc. And guess what? They all disappeared, all vanished. But this small nation, this small people is still among us. Ask yourselves why. But it's another subject. I'm not going to go into that. And so is the church, by the way. It's been persecuted like crazy, and yet it's growing the most in the countries where it's been persecuted the most. Likewise, we want as a local church to preserve what makes the good news of Jesus Christ unique. We can never forget who we are and why we exist. We have been graced by God to be a blessing to the world. We are a people saved by the gospel of grace of God, and we want to share it in love and respect with all people. And in his letter, Jeremiah told the Jews from Babylon to do at least four things. And he starts by reminding them something very important in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4 through 7. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all I, I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, etc., etc. But he started with, I carried in Babylon. He started by reminding them something very important. God is sovereign over history. He is the Lord. He is the one who carried his own people into exile to Babylon. He will say it four times in this text. Four times. To all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. God takes responsibility here. He reassures us he is still in control. He reminds his people that he is sovereign God who controls history from beginning to end. Since the beginning of creation when we, he created humans in his image and in spite of the fall, God is still in charge and his plan of redemption by his promised Messiah and Redeemer is still operational and en marche. Let's never lose hope then, even when history seems uh, like it's going crazy. We know the God who holds his promises. And we know the end of, uh, of the story from the beginning because the Bible says so. And it ends well for the good guys, for his enemy. God is just and he will judge them according to his righteousness. Even death, my friends, of the righteous is powerless to thwart the plans of God for his creation. So in spite of the dire circumstances, you and I will face in our life. I don't know your future. I don't know mine. Let's take courage. Evil has been condemned and overcome at the cross by the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we're going to celebrate at Easter pretty soon. The grand story on this side of eternity is coming to an end before a grand new beginning. That's the Christian hope. So let's rejoice with Jeremiah, that's why it's easy also to draw a parallel to identify with the people of God. Verse 10, when the 70 years are completed to Babylon, for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Oh, how I love that, don't you? The first request from God to his people in Babylon was settle down. Verse 5. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Don't believe the false prophets that uh, promise falsely you will soon return. There will be a return, yes, in 70 years. So settle down. We are in Babylon for the long run. Build your house. Plant your gardens. Start businesses and prepare to weather the storm. Martin Luther was asked, what, what would you do if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow? He said, oh, I would go and plant a tree. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but don't forget to enjoy life 
that God has given you. Even here in Babylon. So eat your crops. Enjoy the fruit of your labor. Huh? That's basically what God is asking them to do. If I were to make a parallel, I'd say they were to arm themselves mentally and spiritually to persevere huh, in faithfulness for the next 70 years. They had to start planning for the next generation. What about us? What about you? Should we look back and live in nostalgia, remembering the good old days when uh, the church had a lot of influence in society? I don't think so. That's not our job. The change of paradigm to pass from uh, the Christian era in a Europe to in a in a in a post-Christian Europe, uh, which lives in a new kind of pagano atheistic society, took hundreds of years in the making. So unless the Lord returns suddenly to establish his kingdom by putting an end to all the proud Babylons of the earth, unless there is a massive revival prov provoked by the Holy Spirit for which we can all pray, it will be business as usual, my friend. We're in there for the long run. So let's stop complaining. Let's stop behaving like victims. You know, it's a, it's a word in fashion again. As if it was better before when Judeo-Christian values shaped everyday life. Yes, we're heading back to the barbarian values. Seems. But remember, being a victim is not your and I, our identity. Children of the coming king, that's who we are. Second request from God to his people in Babylon, build strong families and multiply. Marry and have daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in numbers. Do not decrease. In other words, build strong families and increase in numbers. To resist in the long run, you and I, we need to build a community. The first community we need, the most intimate, if God will grant us by His, by His grace, one, it's our family. That is why it's so it is important to learn from the scriptures how to build and invest in your families in a godly way. If God grants you the grace of children, ask God to teach you through godly men and women how to be wise husbands and wives. This is your first team. Take care of it. And you who are fathers and mothers, remember you have a tremendous responsibility. You're the first and last line of defense for your kids. Ask God to teach you through spiritual fathers and mothers uh, who will help you raise your children in their love and respect of the Lord. It is not an easy task. Through screens, we are in competition with Hollywood. Toxic values, day in, day out, even at night. Through schools, teachers have them under their influence six hours a day, at least while you are at work or at home. Many do a terrific job in the schools of the Republic, and we should be thankful for them, and are as neutral as possible. But they don't always share your values. I remember being, I, being indoctrinated by atheist uh, professors into Marxist thinking and Stalinian ideas as young as 15 years old, by well-intentioned teachers who were teaching their values. The anti-Christian bias was not even subtle. It took me years as an adult to figure it out. Yes, the competition is unfair, but God is with us. Emmanuel, that's what it means. I thank him. I had godly parents and a good church taking care of the youth. It was a fun and dynamic place to be. Thanks to the church, I met people from the Eastern Bloc, uh, from the west, from the north and the south. It was multi-ethnic, just like ours. We were even 37 nationalities in 2011, when, uh, 2000, yeah, when we celebrated our um, uh, 50th anniversary. I received solid Christian teaching and a coherent worldview uh, that helped me to put in perspective the culture, the culture war uh, we were going through. I did the same with my kids. I sought I saw to win their heart and their mind, not just their compliance to a desirable behavior. Be good Christians. 
That's all I care about. Then you can do whatever you want. No, I sought to win their spirit, their heart, their, their minds. Each time we went to the movies, we debriefed uh, after at the fast food joint to understand the subliminal worldview and message the producers wanted to pass to their viewers because they were very ideological most of the time. Oh, always remember, Hollywood is not neutral and value-free. That's a lie. Neither are the schools. That's why Jeannie and I never counted the hours and money we spent with young people in our school, high schoolers, college students, in our church activities. Um, we served them as Bible teachers, uh, taxi drivers, uh, counselors, cooks, and innkeepers, and countless other functions. We made sure the kids of the church and ours were the prime beneficiaries of our efforts, and it paid up by the grace of God. If we are to resist the spirit of this age, we need to build strong communities. There's a second community larger than the first we need to build. Let's remember the church. It is to be a family, your family, our family, made of families and single individual, young and old, French or not, from all walks of life and ethnicity, married or not, with children or not. We need one another in the body of Christ. We need to take care of one another. Each one of us is precious in the eyes of God. Each one of us has received at least one spiritual gift uh, to build this local body, the local church. Therefore, go and make disciples, Jesus said. This is the job of everyone. It's not just the job of the pastor or missionaries or elders or even the job of those who have the gift of the evangelist. We are all his witnesses, uh, said Jesus. It's our identity before even we do anything else. It's our identity. Whatever your gift is, you and I can contribute to grow the body of Christ. Disciples have a vocation to multiply, just like we read in this text. Disciples are not born, but they are made. We are to make disciples, not of ourselves, but another. Disciples of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Remember that governments and politicians can't answer all your needs and desire, even if they promise. Don't believe them. They can't deliver all, their, all they promise. Don't make idols out of them. Revolutionaries want to change the world from the top down. We in the country, with Jesus Christ, we want to build the kingdom of God from bottom up with the Lord Jesus. We want to win one person at a time, one neighbor at a time, one family at a time. That's why we all need to go as Jesus commanded and make disciples in our daily occupations. Until his kingdom come, it could be 70 years or it could be before the sunset. Are you ready? The third request, seek the good of the city. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Seek its shalom. That's the word that's being used in Hebrew here, literally. Seek its harmony and well-being. To paraphrase late uh, President John Kennedy, don't ask what your city can or government can do for you, but what you can do for them, uh, for the country. Let's seek to work for the common good of our neighbors uh, and town halls. Let's be contributors rather than profiteers. Let's cultivate an attitude of gratitude toward uh, God and our communities rather than discontent. Let's be respectful of those who govern us. We have so much to be thankful for, even if, if there is uh, room for improvement. Let's become actors, not just spectators and consumers of social services. Some Christians think the highest form of spiritual dedication is to become a minister or a missionary. I pray God that there will be many that go out from this church. But it is not the vocation of everybody. But if we were to disappear uh, as a church from this neighborhood, would somebody notice? That's a good question, isn't it? Maybe your gift 
is somewhere else as an agent of the kingdom. If you're destined to be a plumber, remember, plumbing is not your identity, but be the best plumber you can for the kingdom. You are only an agent disguised as a plumber whose mission is to promote the kingdom of God uh, and his goals in the workplace. If you are a homemaker, remember you are first and foremost a disciple maker, working from home, turning little savages into decent men and women that Jesus sends into this lost world. And a word to the fathers, help your wives. Don't delegate just, oh, education is for women to mother at home. No, no, no. This week I heard a journalist saying, where are the fathers after there was a horrible crime committed by a 15-year-old boy uh, against another kid his age? It's our gift. If it's our gift, by our activity, let's become part of those who give work by creating businesses, wealth, and employment for others. Let's bless people. Some of you should become elected board members uh, who participate to management of the city. Uh, if that is your vocation, you won't do it for the party, but for the king and for the kingdom. You will also do it uh, to benefit your fellow men in the city. We want to bless people by all means. That should be our attitude as Christians. Let's remember the poor, said Jesus, in and out of the church. Did you know that you could help here in this, in this place, uh, the Foyer Evangelique Universitaire, to distribute food? Uh, to the hundreds of needy college students on this ca college campus. That's what happens here quite regularly. Ask, ask, ask people here to give you info. Seek the shalom of your neighborhood. Seek the true peace of God for your neighbors. It can be done in many ways. As a community, are we known to be peacemakers? Do we seek to embody the great message of reconciliation between races and former and uh, races and former enemies? Do we know how to disagree respectfully with our neighbors and authorities when we have to? Do we know how to tell the truth in love on one-on-one -on -one basis? Or are we perceived as troublemakers and angry people all the time? We know that the ultimate peace starts with being reconciled with God. How can I bring peace and forgiveness if I haven't received it first in my heart from God? That's why we never want to forget that acts of mercy and words go together, hand in hand. That's why we always uh, seek to share with respect and love and kindness the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the reason why we won't become cynics in spite of the world poor state, poor state of the world in decay today. He is the hope that God has placed uh, in our hearts. He is our shalom. No Jesus, no peace, N-O. No Jesus, K-N-O-W, Jesus, and you will know peace, K-N-O-W. Fourth request, and last, to his people, pray for the city. Pray the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Pray for the city where I carried you in exile. That must have been such a shocking request to those refugees. They had witnessed such horrors and suffered tremendously in their flesh and families during the siege of Jerusalem. The cruelty of the Babylonians was on par with that of all the great dictators of history. And they were to pray for the good of the city. Why? The Bible says we don't primarily fight against flesh and blood, but against evil. Uh, powers and spirits in the heavenly realm. That's why we need spiritual weapons to survive and thrive in this culture war. Love, truth, and prayer. These are our spiritual weapons as Christians. That's why we need to resort to prayer. Pray then for our president, our city officials, our government, our police, our army. Bless them uh, for the good they do. Pray for freedom. To share the gospel without fear, which, and without which there is no hope for the world. Pray God to deliver us from evil. We need to pray against the evil powers and enemies of humanity. Hoodlums, drug lords, terrorists, human traffickers, corrupt officials, people 
in authority, who are in total darkness and spiritually blind and who oppress the people. Yes? Pray our Heavenly Father to bring to repentance and faith our enemies and our oppressors. Oh, pray God in His justice to remove them from their place so it will be given to others that will allow us to lead peaceful and honest lives. I have seen many of these prayers answered many times in my life. Why did God ask them to pray while in Babylon? Verse 12. You will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. He asked them to pray because our battle is first and foremost spiritual. And the first battleground is our hearts. We often pray so God would change our difficult circumstances. But you can expect this when you start praying. It's your heart that God will show you. He needs to change first. God had brought them to Babylon as a judgment, but also as a means for them to seek Him. So they could repent, so God could restore them and bless them again and bring them back. When you pray then, expect God to speak to you and show you the state of your heart. When you know uh, you have been forgiven, you will start to pray even for your former enemies. How can we love if we, uh, for free if we haven't realized how much we've been loved ourselves and forgiven freely in Jesus Christ? Why did God ask them to pray? Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. What a wonderful promise and a wonderful God we have. He was the offended one. He still has, um, uh, um, and yet he still has a heart to bless you and me, his people. On the cross, he prayed for you and me when he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. How gracious on the part of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we don't know uh, what circumstances, uh, happy or painful, there will be in our lives. Our hope is for our countries uh, to be brought to the light of Jesus Christ and repentance so you could bless us as a nation, but also as individuals and families. Oh Lord, may your spirit blow on our country, on our countries, on our families, on our heart, on our churches. Help us to be salt and light in this world. Protect us from living in um, egotistically and uh, retreating in our own bubbles. Help us to remember the lost around us. Fill us with love uh, for the whole world and for our neighbors first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And sorry.